So tonight we're doing our fourth class in this five-class series on the door with six keys. And today we're going to look at the fourth and hopefully start the fifth key because we have three keys and two classes left. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so what we what we're dealing with again, just to remind us, is we have. During the month of Elul, we're in this process of teshuva. And we're supposed to look at ourselves and say, where have I gone? What have I done? Where have I um, led myself throughout this year to move away from Hashem, or as we spoke metaphorically, to get out of the letter He, which represents being together with Hashem in this world. And instead, we've put ourselves outside by placing all our emphasis and all our focus on living lives based on physicality and indulgence in the world and focusing away from connecting to Hashem and living meaningful spiritual lives. And if we find it easy to look at ourselves and just snap our fingers and return to Hashem, I said, if you can do that, then there's no need for this class. Because that means that you have an open door. But if you say, well, you know, I'd like to, but I'm kind of finding it difficult. I enjoy my life and where it's taken me. That means you've got a door with locks on it. But you have a ring. And any of these six keys can be used to open that door. So in the first class, we discussed key number one, which is to use all the difficulties that you go through in life, to use all the suffering and pain that you may experience, which might or might not be punishment, or, but you can definitely take it all as a message and inspire yourself to become a better person as you experience the difficulties, turning those negatives into ways of moving yourself forward and becoming more positive in life. Turning those, um, that lemonade back into uh, uh, orange juice, right? So, something <laughs> sweet. Okay, the second, the second key was using aging, that process, when at life, Hashem gave us the gift that we don't just suddenly disappear, after 120, but instead there's a process where the person slowly begins to show signs of aging. First, it's a small um, sign, a small hint, and then, you know, bigger parts start to fall off, and then the muffler is, uh, and the, uh, all the different things, and the engine needs replacing, and, and uh, you know, you need an oil change more often. You know, all these things that happen to us, which are messages that the clock is ticking, Using that as a motivation, and we said especially when you reach certain milestones in life, um, you're supposed to use those milestones as a way to focus your life more on what you ultimately want to accomplish, which is put in very morbid terms, but you know, it's before Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, you're allowed to use more morbid terms. What will they say at your funeral? What do you want written on your tombstone? That question, and we shouldn't think of it in those words, but what do you want to accomplish in life? And as a person gets older, you have to start moving away from living an indulgent and pleasurable focus. You can still indulge and have all the pleasures of the world, but that's not your focus. Your focus becomes on accomplishing for the next world. That was the second key, using the aging process. The third key was to have people in your life who inspire you, and to be open to that inspiration. And it's not necessarily the same. One comes with the other. You can have people in your life who are inspirational. And when we talked about inspirational, we talked about people who are going to reprove you as well. People who are going to criticize you. And most of us have all these walls where we react and deflect any criticism. And sometimes it's because that criticism is not well placed and not well given. 
That's true, but we still need to use these opportunities as ways to improve ourselves. But we were focused more on the fact that if you do have someone who is qualified or is in that place to reprove you, we said the, the community leaders, the rabbis, the sages, their job is to give us that reproof. Certainly there, we have to be open and we have to be willing to use it and listening and allowing their words to be absorbed within us and inspire us to change that's the third key to opening the door to being able to return to Hashem. And today we begin with the fourth key, which is study. Or as we called it, a study in scripture. To actually learn the right things that you need to learn, which will motivate you. And what we mean by that is, when you study Torah, Besides for all the other benefits, as we know, the Talmud Torah, Kenegat Kulam, the study of Torah itself is um, equivalent to all the commandments. It is one of the most rewarding of the commandments, both in the physical realm and in the spiritual realm. The reward that comes with it is very great. But we're not so focused on the mitzvah itself, but just what the study of Torah allows you to do and to become. A famous story is told of the young man who came to the yeshiva and said to the Rosh Yeshiva, he said, I want to come and study Torah and connect to the Torah. I want to be more religious and more observant. But I have a lot of questions that drag on me, that nag on me. And it, it stops me from being able to dedicate myself to the service of God. So the rabbi said, I'll make a deal with you. If you study in the yeshiva for six months and you give yourself to that study, at the end of six months, I will answer every one of your questions. Whatever question you have, we'll sit for hours, we'll sit for days, we'll sit for weeks, and we'll discuss it, whatever you need. After about a year, the rabbi comes back to the student and said, you know, after six months, you were supposed to come back to me. I've been waiting. And famously, and, you know, there's different opinions as to who this story is attributed to, but famously, the student replied, um, after just a few months, I realized I had no questions. Because sometimes your questions are based on preconceived notions, which just the studying and the opening of one's mind to what's written in the Torah, that itself resolves and deals with some of the most difficult questions. It doesn't mean every question is answered. But for this particular student, some of his questions, such as, what does God want from me? Why should I dedicate myself to Torah? What's in it for me? And these types of questions, just study, and you'll see. You'll see how rich and meaningful and I, I'm going to use this term, even though some people would be upset if I use this term, pleasurable. That studying of Torah is pleasurable. I know plenty of people who that's the only safe place they have in the whole world, is when they, when they study Torah. It's the, uh, their whole life is in shambles, and then they come into the base medrash, and they sit down and they study, and for that three, four, five hours, whatever, whatever time they give to it, at that point, they're actually in a good place. And, and I'm not just saying it because of that. I'm not saying that anyone should use, replace proper therapy that someone needs with just Torah study. I'm just saying that Torah study itself will motivate us and inspire us to become better people, especially those parts of the Torah which are meant to inspire us. The story is told, and this is in the uh, book of Malachim, uh, book 2, that there was a king called Yoshiyahu. Yoshiyahu is considered one of the greatest of the Jewish kings. What happened was, he was inspired to fix up the Beis HaMikdash, to fix up the temple. The temple had been put into ruins by um, his father and grandfather, both of whom were evil kings, uh, of whom it is said that in their days, the Mizbeach, the altar, was covered in spider webs. That's what the Talmud tells us, in the days of Menashe and Ammon. And he was, became king at a very young age, and 
he was still a teenager, he was 18, when he was inspired that he wants to bring back the service of the temple. And he sent out the Kohanim, the people, to fix up the temple. And during this process, this the Navi tells us, they found a Sefer Torah. Except it's not called Sefer Torah, it's called Sefer HaTorah. Which means they found a certain specific Sefer Torah. And we know, we know what Sefer Torah that was. He found Moshe Rabbeinu's Sefer Torah, the original, the first Sefer Torah ever written, which was supposed to be hidden in, it was supposed to be in the temple, but it was hidden away. It was hidden away when one of the uh, Kohanim saw that the kings were evil and that. Um, things needed to be put away for safekeeping. And so they found this Sefer Torah while they were doing renovations in the Beis HaMikdash. And the thing is that the Sefer Torah is usually, this Sefer Torah is usually turned to the beginning of the Torah. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And instead, it was turned to another place. And they brought it before the king, and the king said, read from it. And there they read on the page that the Sefer Torah was rolled to, God will take you and your king and drive them into exile. That's actually from this week's parsha, Parsha's Kisavo in the reproof, in the Tochacha of this week's parsha. And the king, this young Yoshiahu, saw this as a message. He was being sent a message by God. And he sent out throughout the land and destroyed all the temples for the idols. And he, he cleaned up the country, cleaned up, he did a lot of great things. And he himself and brought many Jewish people back to Hashem and re rededicated the service of the Beis HaMikdash. And the, um, the, the Neviah, the prophetess, Hulda, one of the seven prophetesses, sent a message to the king saying, I've received the prophecy that it was supposed to be that the destruction of the temple was going to happen in your generation, but because of how good you've been, it has been delayed, it has been put off, and you shall die happy you know, in the graves of your parents, and, uh, and a future generation shall suffer. That's someone who got a message from the Torah that was being read to him. He could have said, oh, wow, that's funny, that's a coincidence. He also could have said, I'm, I'm pretty good, this must not apply to me. But instead, he studied Torah, and whatever Torah he studied, he took that as a message. This is, Rabbi Yonah continues in his explanation of this fourth way. And he says, if you do learn, if you do study Torah, and you don't allow it to penetrate you, that's actually a greater crime than not studying Torah at all. Torah is supposed to make you a better person. Torah will make you a better person. If you resist that, that means that you are only interested in Torah as an intellectual exercise, as a form of wisdom like any other philosophy. Because I could study the philosophy of another religion, and when it talks about how beautiful their religion is, I can accept that as fact without being in any way inspired to join that religion. But that's because I've already made a decision that whatever I'm reading here is only information and an intellectual study. And I have the power to close off a true interest in that. He says, if someone does that to Torah, our sages tell us, someone who studies but doesn't fulfill, that means they don't allow the Torah to affect them in any way. Such a person, our sages say, would have been better not to have been born. It's as if that person has negated the value of their life. Because people who never study Torah, they're going to come up to heaven and God's going to say to them, why didn't you keep my Torah? And they'll say, well, I wasn't raised in a place where they could teach me this. And God will say, okay, fine. But this is, here's some of the stuff you should have known. So let's see how you did. Kindness is a universal given. How did you do with kindness? How did you do with this? How did you do with that? How did you treat other people? And how did you act based on the morals that you did have? And then based on that, God might say to him, well, see how well you kept what you knew was right and wrong. So we can assume that had you had the Torah, you would have kept. There is a place to judge. But if you actually know the Torah, if you are familiar with the Torah, um, and then you don't 
That means that you've put yourself in the world to bring yourself to a negative place. It might have been better not to be born. Harsh statement. So I'd like to, if I could just for a few minutes, share with you. It's a little bit off the topic, at least some of it. But just to share with you the power of Torah. Because it is one of the things we need to think about. And the truth is we're discussing the mitzvah of teshuva. And teshuva and Torah are linked, but they're not one. You can do teshuva without necessarily focusing on your study of Torah. However, the reason why I'd like to put some emphasis on this is because that is your Torah study and where you are in Torah uh, is part of what you need to assess at the end of the year. This is the time to make a reckoning of all aspects of our observance, including Torah study. So, if I may, I'll share with you the following. This is from the Midrash on Eicha. Eicha is, of course, Lamentations, which discusses the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. And the Midrash is trying to feel out, trying to figure out, why was the Temple destroyed? Tani Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai taught, Imra Isa Ayaros Nislashos Bimkoman Be'eretz Yisrael. If you see a city which is destroyed, which is literally uprooted in Eretz Yisrael, da you should know, that it's because they did not support Torah study. And we learned this in our Gemara class on Shabbos, that every town had to have, every city had to have 10 people who dedicate themselves to Torah study. But not just those, but even schools and day schools. So if you see a community in Eretz Yisrael which is destroyed, if you see a city that's destroyed, they did not support the Torah education system. That would mean both for children and for adults. Shinamar, as it says, Alma of the Haaretz, the prophet asks, why was the land destroyed? Vayomer Hashem, this is in Yirmiya, Vayomer Hashem and God said, Al Azvam es Torah si, because they abandoned my Torah. Rebbe sent um, to Reb Asi and Rebbe Ami, he sent them to go and help support and help build up some of the cities in Eretz Yisrael. They came to one town and they said, bring us the Nature Karta. You may be familiar with this term. But they said, bring us the Nature Karta, which literally means Shomrei Ha'ir, which translates as the guardians of the city. I'd like to have a meeting with the guardians of the city. So they brought him, the guy who's in charge of security for that city, and the guy who's in charge of weapons, and the guy who's in charge of tactics, and the guy who's in charge of the, the walls defenses, and they sat down. He said, what are these guys doing here? So they said, well, you asked for the guardians of the city. He says, these are not the guardians of the city. Ilan Harove Karta, these are the destroyers of the city. So they said, so then who are you, who are you looking for? He said, I was looking for your teachers and your scholars. It's they who I need to meet with in order to plan and help support the development of your city. Pretty powerful medrash, right? Because uh, they, they could have just said, I want to speak to the rabbis, the scholars, the teachers. But they were trying to make a point because... The, these were cities where the people felt that the protection of the city, that the protection of the Jewish community comes from movements and all other kinds of things. The Jewish community survives because we have a good day school system. And you can, you can look throughout, go look in those places, in those communities where there used to be a thriving Jewish community. And since then they've disappeared in the United States. And you can see what went was the education system and the rabbis that were brought in who made shifts in the in Torah observance and slowly those this, those communities disappeared many of them have assimilated out but that wasn't that's not the main place where we're going rather Rabhuna and Rabbi Yeremia in the name of Rabbi Shmuel Bar Yitzchak said God would have forgiven the idol worship I shouldn't say forgiven. God would have looked past the idol worship. God would have looked past the adultery. And God would have looked past the murder. But God could not look past the rejection of Torah. 
Now, that sounds puzzling. Why would God look past all these things? So he explains, because it says in Yermia, For Osi Ozavu, they abandoned me, the Estorah si lo shamaru, and they didn't guard or keep my Torah. Now that's a double language, right? They abandoned me and they didn't keep my Torah. Once they've abandoned God, isn't it obvious that they've abandoned the Torah? Says the Medrash, powerful words. Halavai, I wish, O si azvu, they would have abandoned me, the Torah si shamru, but still kept the Torah. Mitoch shayim is asking because if they just immerse themselves in Torah study, Hamaor Shaba Hayamachzira Mamutav, the light in the Torah would have brought them back. God is saying, if someone's an idol worshiper, but is trying to study Torah and learn more and better themselves, then they'll figure out a way back. If adultery, murder, any of these things, horrible things that people do, if they would have stayed with the Torah, in other words, they would have still stayed in the group, they would have not have locked themselves out, it would have been a hard trip, but they could have made it back. But when you close your door to Torah, when you don't study Torah, sometimes because you're not interested, or sometimes because you feel that what you've done, you're no longer in that group, you can't come back. Because there's nothing to inspire you to come back. That's what the measure says. I really thought you were going to say Sinat Chinam when you were saying, you know, if Hashem forgave this and forgave that, but he didn't forgive Sinat Chinam. So were they studying Torah at the time? So this is, Yirmi- this is Yirmiya, which is the first temple. Ah. So the second temple was, was for baseless hatred. Yeah. But were they studying Torah at that time? It sounds like he's saying they weren't. They weren't. You know, at the time of... of, of yeah, the second basic is they were studying Torah. So why didn't that happen? Why so didn't it bring them back to realize that they weren't doing the right thing? Right. So the question is, how come we have plenty of people who are studying Torah and it doesn't make them better people? Yeah. And there's people who are very knowledgeable in Torah. And there's explanations for that. Mostly it's because um, they put up these walls around themselves and stop the Torah from penetrating them, which is what we discussed before. And that makes them actually worse than those who don't study Torah at all. But there are people, there are people who study Torah, and when they see something which tells them or moves them to become better, they deflect it. We all have these defense mechanisms inside of us which convince us that certain things are things we should take on and certain things we shouldn't. And if you put up those walls, then the Torah can't penetrate. But if you would have just studied Torah and learned it and studied it, and I'm tell- I see this, and I speak to anyone who's involved in the process of trying to bring people closer to Judaism, there's nothing more powerful than the study of Torah, even if it's not about the Torah, which discusses how they should change their lives. Torah is the light of the world. And it's hard to say it because we live in such a strange world where anything that's not tangible or measurable is, is seen as some kind of metaphor. It's not a metaphor. Torah is powerful. It will inspire you. It will move you, regardless of which Torah you learn. If you learn Torah about Shabbos, certainly it will inspire you to be more greatly connected to Shabbos. If you study ab- about Chesed, doing kindness, it will inspire you more about kindness. That's for sure. And saying Even if you study about Shabbos, it will make you a kinder person. And if you study about kindness, it will connect you more to Shabbos because the Torah is itself a light which moves you and cleanses you and helps you come closer to God. What if the commission of all these, of the three cardinal sins, the adultery, the murder, in and of itself be enough to show that the people had left Torah would not? Because, because those things are, are... Yeah, but you know, there's no crime. There's no crime that anyone can do that says that that means that they're not interested. It just means that they're struggling with something, they're going through something potentially. There's an attitude that comes with the crime which makes them be beyond redemption, at least seemingly beyond redemption. So if someone if is... People, right, it, it depends. There are, people who, there are people who kill out of a passion and the moment it's done, they're 
they feel guilty. That's a very sick person who needs help, obviously, but that's not a person who can't be, a, who can't come back. Because it is someone, as long as, it's hard to say this about a murderer because he killed someone, but the fact is that there are plenty of people who've killed, regretted what they've done, and have turned their lives around, and after doing their 20 years in prison, they come out and they try to give back to the community and they do all these things because they feel guilty about what they've done. And not, obviously not trying to downplay the, uh, how horrible murder is, but the, it doesn't mean that the person is beyond redemption. There really is no crime which of itself makes any person beyond redemption. And that's, uh, unfortunately, many people say to themselves, you know, if, if people would know what I've done, if God would know what I've done, he knows what you've done. Right? If, if, if No person can't at any point say, well, it doesn't matter, I may have killed 20 people, but I'm stopping now, I'm turning myself around, and assuming that they get all the psychological help that they need, in theory, they can come back and be a very good and productive person in the world. I think there are people who've committed crimes that are large enough that means they don't have any redemption. Well, I don't know if the crime is large enough or where they were when yeah. they... But you see, it's not about the crime. It's not because he killed that many Jews. It's because of the level of hatred of the how far he descended into... Um, despising people to the point where he dehumanized them. That's what makes him more irredeemable than the actual instructions that he gives. Uh, now, it goes together. You could not possibly give instructions like that unless you brought yourself to a place where you now represent evil. It doesn't just, he didn't just do evil. He personified evil. So, but that's because he brought himself to a certain place, which that, being that evil, allowed him to go on such a mission in such a direction. But that's where he was lost already. He wasn't coming back from that. So, we're saying it's not the crime so much, it's where you are and what your, where your place is in the world which decides whether you can come back. So if people are committing crimes, and each time they do it, they feel bad about it, there's still a place for them to come back. So it may be that in American law, that the person was sent to prison and they get out in 20 years, but by Jewish law, if there were witnesses, he would have been murdered. He would have been killed himself, so right. there is no coming right. back. Right, but we say that in that case... The, we actually were told, it's a Mishnah in Masech the Sanhedrin, that says that before anyone is killed mm -hmm. by the courts, that person would confess. And the line in his confession he would say, this is actually a special confession, you know, before a person leaves the world, they, we, we do a video, we give them an opportunity to confess. If they're not there, someone does it for them. But... There's a special video for those being executed by the courts, which says, and may this execution be an atonement for the sin which I did. So in a sense, that person's redemption happens through that. And when they come up to heaven, they're actually not punished for that crime because they're given the gift of complete atonement for such a horrible crime, which comes with the death penalty. All the stuff that they didn't get atonement for is still there. So, but, but they didn't get to but, the point of killing somebody without... Right, killing. so we're saying it's not because they're beyond redemption. They're actually, to a certain extent, being given a gift, an opportunity. To, it's hard to say that, but it is. It is a chance for what we call kapara, which other people don't get. You get an atonement. And, and actually, execution, as we're told, covers all the sins. And the person goes to Olam Abba, like they have a portion in the world to come. And the uh, first person executed by Yeshua, which was Achan, he's the one who we derive these laws from, he, uh, and Yeshua says to him, if you give confession to God, you have a portion in the world to come. So they're, they're not beyond redemption. This might be their process of redemption. But this is an important point, because what we're saying is as long as you stay involved, as long as your mind is still open and put this into the clearest terms possible, you haven't given up on yourself, you can still come back. But if you've locked yourself in a place where you can no longer come back, and the sign for a person who's religious, which shows whether or not, is whether they're still looking, searching, studying, learning. That's what you need to keep doing. And here, I'm going to take this a step further. The language of the Midrash we just read was Hama'or Shabbat, the light within the Torah, 
Machziron lemutav would bring you back for the good, would bring you back to the good. There's an alternate version of this text, not in the Midrash, but in the Yerushalmi. The Yerushalmi says it a little different, and here are these words. She'ilu osi azvu tarasi shamaru. Even if they abandon me, even if they sin, but they keep my Torah. Strange words. Hasaor shaba haya mekarvan etzli. Not hamaor, the light in the Torah, but hasaor, the sourdough. Right? With an olive. Hasaor shaba haya mekarvan etzli. The sourdough would have brought them back to me. The sourdough in the Torah. Anyone want to try? What does that mean? If they would have just kept studying, saor, saor, as in sourdough. Uh Is that where the word sour came from? Maybe. Interesting. What? What did you say? I said, is that where the word sour came from? Maybe. That's interesting. Are you gonna? I was thinking of the the starter that you use for sour. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. That's that's what. Kicks out, kicks, kickstarts the fermentation process. Right, so it yep. rises; it causes to rise the dough, just like the so, Torah so, study is is going to make you rise and and sort of broaden your perspective. And right. So one of the commentaries um, almost says uh, those words that you just uh, that you just said. That uh, basically it. Uh, and the, the Torah, but it doesn't sound like it literally because it's, it's the sourdough within the Torah. So what is the sourdough within the Torah? You're, you're reading it more as the effect that the Torah will have, which is the rising of the Torah will, will affect you. But the literal uh, translation is that the sourdough in the Torah. And this connects very much to what we discussed um, in our first class. And we're going to get a little metaphysical here, but it's important. We said that God created the worlds on many levels. The highest world is actually related to the Yud of God's name. The next world is related to the Hey, and then the Vav, and then finally the final Hey of God's name, that's the realm which we live in when we are connected to God, and that's the Hey which we spoke about, which we're trying to get reconnect to. That's why the word Teshuvah we've said multiple times, is Tashuv Hay, to return into the Hay, into the place where we are with God in the world. So we asked, why is this world a Hay? Why the letter Hay? So we explained then, because this world is basically, gives you lots of options to stay with God, but much like the letter Hay, which is open on the bottom, you have the choice to walk away. God gave us free will. And in free will, you have the choice to walk away. And the hay is a letter which has walls on three sides and an opening on the bottom for you to walk away. So we mentioned in the first class, but there's another letter like that, which is actually a better representation, the letter ches. Because the ches is actually three full walls. The hay is two full walls and then one half wall. So the Gemara asks that question. And the Gemara says that that you need a doorway at the top to get back in. So this world is shaped like a hay. Asks the Gemara, well then why can't you go back in through the same way you left? Through the bottom of the ches. The Gemara says, you can't go back in the way that you left. If you want to come back in, you need to change. You need to find a new entrance. And we explain then that actually, if you look at the hay, the opening in that third wall is at the top. So not only do you come back in, but you actually come out higher than you when you left. Because tzaddikim cannot stand. Even the most righteous people are unable to reach the level of a Baal Teshuvah, of someone who had to actually return and go through that process. So by doing Teshuvah, you end up at the top of the hay. You're in the highest place connected to God. That's what we said in the first class. You may know that, that there on Pesach, we have the mitzvah to avoid chametz and to eat matzah. Chametz and matzah have almost the same letters, except chametz is a mem, a tzadi, and a ches, and matzah is a mem, a tzadi, and a hey. So chametz is that part of you which convinces you in your head that you've left and you can't come back. 
while when you eat the matzah, what becomes revealed is that this world is a hay and you're never lost, you can always come back. That's the difference between chametz and matzah. But <coughs> the mem and the tzadi, those other two letters, as we see, are related to the word mitzvah, the mem and the tzadi. By chametz, the ches is in front. It's telling you don't bother. By matzah, you do the mitzvahs and you connect and then, then you find the hay. What is chametz? What is chametz? Chametz is what takes, because flour and water, matzah is just flour and water, and bread is flour and water. Except what's the difference between matzah and bread? In the case of bread, you've allowed leavening agents to enter the dough, to fill it with air, and blow it up through the fermentation process. That's the only difference, same ingredients. But what you've allowed is for something rotten, to enter into the dough and to start changing it and affecting it and blowing it up so that it becomes big and blown up. There's a name for that. That's your Yetzer Hara, your evil inclination. Because you were created flour and water. You were created as flour and water. You are the dough which is not supposed to have any fermentation process in it. But... What we did was, and really it's Adam and Chava who did this, when they eat of the tree, they introduce a natural rotting agent into the person, which then, you know, if you, um, typically you want to make challah, you add yeast. Why do you add yeast? To start the process. And if you don't add yeast, it doesn't what? It doesn't rot. At all? You don't get very good challah. It takes, it takes a very long time because there's natural yeast in the air, but it takes a very long time for that dough to capture all that yeast. So you don't want to wait three days or however long it would take. But leavening happens on its own because it's in the air. And in the same way, you, there is a natural evil inclination that exists in you, which is naturally going to cause you to say, I want, I want, I want, blowing you up and making you want more. Making you live a life that's about yourself. Making you live your life which is about physicality and indulgence, and it slowly rots away at your spiritual being. And what we've done is, what we do, every time you add a sin, every time you add a sin, you're actually taking yeast and adding it to the dough instead of just having that natural yeast in the air. We buy a Fleischmann's bag of sins and put it into, the, into our dough. And that takes us to this place where we... Our sages tell us, one of the sages used to pray to God, he used to say, God, I really want to be good. But I'm held up by two issues. The sourdough in my dough and the persecution of, of uh, the world around me. Which they say is a metaphor. The Yetzirah inside of you and the Yetzirah outside of you. There are two things which cause you to deviate from God. Your internal, natural challenges... And then there's all the influences of the media, of your friends, of the people around you who challenge you, who make you angry, who make you... So the sourdough is your evil inclination. The Gemara in Kedushim tells us a puzzling statement, which is there must be a uh, hundred different explanations of this, at least. Amr lahem HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yisrael Hashem says to the Jewish people, Banai, my children, Barasi Yetzer Hara. I created an evil inclination. Ubarasi lo Torah Tavlin. And I created the Torah as the Tavlin. Anyone translate the word Tavlin? Antidote. That's the way it's usually translated. Is that the correct translation? No, isn't it the yeast sort of thing? Well, Tavlin... Tavlin is literally spice. Oh, spice. I have, this is what the Gemara says. I have created your evil... God says to the Jewish people, I have given you an evil inclination, but I have given you the Torah as a spice. 
So many people, most commentaries will and you look in any, any translation, and it'll read, I've created the evil inclination, and I've created the Torah as its antidote, or as its remedy. But that's not the translation. Because your evil inclination is not your enemy. Not your enemy. Your evil inclination is your friend. Your challenges are your friends. Because if you use your challenges correctly, you will find yourself a better person. If you have an evil inclination that makes you want to do fun things which waste time, you ask yourself, do I really like to waste time? No one's going to say they like to waste time. So what do I really want? What do I really want? So you can look at your challenges and say, what do I really want? What is the root of this? Because most of the time, we don't look at ourselves closely enough to see how we can better ourselves and look at ourselves and see what our challenges really are. But if we look at our inclinations, we say to ourselves, and I just picked one, but let's take another example, and I will come back to the previous one. If you find you have an inclination to not follow the laws of kosher so much, you say to yourself, what do I really want? What I want is to enjoy the pleasures of this world. Well, how can I channel that towards the good? How can I use my inclination to actually improve myself as a, as a person? How can I maybe go work at a soup kitchen, and I'm just picking a random example, and actually focus on making that food taste good so that people don't feel like they're in the soup kitchen? So you've channeled your indulgence and your knowledge of food and what tastes good into, uh, maybe that's too random an example. But if a person feels that they are overly indulgent Maybe they love too much. So find people who you're supposed to channel that towards and make them and yourself a better person. If you find that you are someone who restricts too much, if you're too angry, maybe you can learn how to channel that into a way to help fix the world because the world does need some more angry people to make a difference. Obviously not the kind of anger where you lose yourself, but anger is a great motivator. There's actually very few motivators that will get someone moving and doing things as anger. You know, there are people who are angry, and even though they, they're, they're maybe um, immobilized, they're, when they're angry, they move and they... And that's... A, the evil inclination, or as the Rambam puts it, there are no bad attributes. Anger is good, haughtiness is good, selfishness is good. Every single one of them is good if used correctly. You just have to channel it. And some of them are, have to be channeled to the point where they're very limited, such as anger or haughtiness. But stinginess, stinginess can be channeled away from stinginess into thriftiness. And the line between thriftiness and stinginess is a very fine one. But one allows you to focus on what you could do with the money in a positive way, maybe give tzedakah and things like that, because you've saved some money, while the other one makes you obsessed with your money. But there's nothing inside of you that's actually rotten. It's all on how you use it. Because if you don't allow the bread to rise properly, you won't actually have a loaf of bread. You'll have just rotting material. But if you help along and allow the fermentation process to be used in a way where it's channeled towards the good, you can actually make yourself a better person. And this explains why seven weeks after Pesach, we know there's a rule that says that no sacrifice ever in the Beis HaMikdash was allowed to have chametz in it. Except for one. What? what on Shavuos. Why? Because seven weeks later when we get the Torah, now we're able to channel the chametz, even the challenges within us, even the evil inclination, can be turned towards the good. So, barasi lo yetzahara, I've created a yetzahara. Your yetzahara is going to cause you harm. But if you put Torah in it, barasi lo Torah tavlin, Torah is the spice 
which actually allows the Yetzirah to become a part of who you are in a positive way. We live in a world which tells us that we are supposed to enjoy every pleasure we want at any time we want. And there are people who are reacting to it, very religious people, who claim that that's falling away from the purpose of creation because the real way to live is to completely cut yourself off from the world. There's a religion that believes that the best way for people to live is for men and women to be completely celibate and live in monasteries. I'm not picking any specific religion, but there are religions like that. And they believe that the only reason why people do otherwise is because of weakness. That's because they can't understand how you can be spiritual while still living a full, healthy, pleasurable, joyous life. The Torah says on the contrary. If you limit yourself in those areas, you are withholding and you are causing harm to yourself, to the people around you, to the Torah and to your God. Instead, everything needs to be channeled and done in a positive way. You want to eat? Save it for Shabbos. Make Shabbos a time when you indulge. If you want to um, go have fun, so do it in a way that's permitted with the right people. Bring joy to others. It can all be done in a way, and actually it turns out that when you do bring joy to others, it turns out to be almost selfish because you enjoy the fact that they enjoyed it more than you enjoy the fact that you enjoyed it. Because the Torah wants us to channel that. The sourdough within the Torah, if we would just connect ourselves to Torah, and I'm not saying how people should do it. I'm not, everyone needs to figure out how they should do it. But everyone needs to have a system for their Torah study. You don't just study Torah when you have a chance. When you have a chance, that's when you take advantage of another moment of Torah study. We have to be kovea itim la Torah. You have to establish your Torah learning times. And it should be often. And I don't mean it has to overwhelm your life. But it should be that 10 minutes a day should be the minimum for a person who's completely overwhelmed. An hour a day should be a minimum for a person who's basically uh, um, you know, living the average busy life. And for people who have more time, two, three hours a day. Okay, so if we don't do two, three hours a day. But every day there should be some Torah study. And I, I shouldn't even be throwing out numbers because it's not fair for anyone who only has 10 minutes to feel guilty that they're not doing an hour. Whatever you do is what you do. Maybe you should feel guilty, like the famous story of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. They once asked him, if uh, someone asked him, I only have five minutes of Torah study, what should I learn? Only five minutes a day. So Rusal Salanter, who is known, he's the founder of the Musser movement, um, you know, of uh, perfecting yourself and making yourself a better person, said you should study Musser five, five minutes a day. So he said to him, but Rabbi, what about Chumash and Gemara and all these other things which are more important? He says, no, 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 I don't mean that Musser is more important. It's just if you would learn Musser for five minutes a day, you would realize that you have more than five minutes a day. <laughs> and that's that's part of what the Torah does for you. So I'd like to just at least begin the next path, even though I've uh, basically almost run out of time. But I, I just want to, to reiterate this point. The fourth key is to connect yourself to Torah, to have books which you read. You can take them anywhere. You can go online and listen to classes. That's a great example of channeling the Yetzirah for the good. There are, I kid you not, millions of hours of Torah online for every single topic you can think of. Like you can go on YouTube and you can find out how to build a chair and how to feed your pet giraffe and how to, you know, all these, how to make a swimming pool out of toothpicks. <laughs> you can go online and you can study on any subject you want. There are, and if you don't, in your community, in your shuls, there are places to study. And even if you don't have time during the week, there, there are people who are giving classes all the time. And it's not just classes. Learn by yourself. You should have a book. You should have a library. You should have, everyone should always have a book that they're in the middle of. And you shouldn't be in the middle of that book for 10 years, but you should, you should be reading that book or your Kindle or whatever people. 
connected to her, and you'll find. And I've never seen anyone ever claim otherwise. If you're, if you're constantly connecting to Torah and studying Torah in a meaningful way, it doesn't just affect you in terms of the Torah you're studying, but it makes you a different person. And people can recognize it. It changes you, and it makes you a person who is easier to be around, you're calmer, you're better, because you're connected to something more meaningful and more deep. And there are so many people who, even though they never think about it, they're constantly, their subconscious is always asking them, what are you doing here in this world? And when you study Torah, that internal struggle is alleviated, and pers- people just feel like they're in a better place and they have more meaning in their life. And there's not much more that a person can ask for. And there's not much more that can inspire a person to do better and to be better with others in their relationships and everything in life than to feel like they stand for something and they mean for something and their life is a life of accomplishment, if not directly in this world, certainly in the next world. So I'd just like to begin, you know, just for the sake of, um, because we are getting closer to Rosh Hashanah, to begin number five. Um, path number five is to use this time of the year to change yourself and bring yourself closer to Hashem. Every day you're supposed to do Teshuva. That's certainly true. But these are the days, the days of Elul, the day coming, Rosh Hashanah coming up, followed by Yom Kippur, you need to use that. And I apologize if I'm using harsh terms. I don't mean it that way. But if you're focused on Rosh Hashanah by the davening, when am I going to get home? If you're looking at your watch on Yom Kippur, if you're thinking about you know, the difficulties and can I just get this over with, that's not what Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are about. They are not a burden. They're an opportunity. This is, this, these days are days of opportunity, days of awe. Yeah, they are awesome in a fearful way. Not in a surfer's awesome kind of way. But they're also an opportunity. This is a chance where God says to you, you're going to be judged And this is your chance to better your ways. And it's strange because you know what? If a person is supposed to does a lot of bad things and they're going to be called up in court and they they behave the last week before their court date and the judge says, you've been committing all these horrible crimes. They say, well, look at my last week. It was a lot better. (laughs) It, It doesn't work that way. But yet God accepts that. God accepts that if you fix yourself over the next couple of weeks, you make yourself better, that there's an assumption that there will be some long-term effect, some long-term effect. We know we make a million promises on Yom Kippur if we are actually fulfilling and completing Yom Kippur. We make all these promises to ourselves. Some of it has to stay. And unfortunately, I'm going to say a statement which for some people is very hard to hear, but I, I think I said something similar last year, and I'm sure everyone remembers, that are you actually, when you approach this Yom Kippur, are you different this Yom Kippur than you were last Yom Kippur? Very, very difficult question to ask ourselves, mostly because we, we don't know what happened to us last week. So for, I was trying to remember, what have I gone through this year? But we need to, and that's sometimes why it's important, maybe we discussed it last year, to write down these things, to talk about some of the things. Make a plan. Make a plan and say, these are my goals for the year. And if you make a budget in your life, and you try at least to work within that budget, even though you deviate, make yourself a spiritual budget and say, over the next year, these are the things I'd like to fix. I'd like to have a healthier relationship with that person. I'd like to talk nicer to the following person. I'd like to be a little more on time for this. I'd like to be a little more dedicated to that. We, we can actually do that. And maybe, when the time you come to next Yom Kippur, you can actually look at this list because you've got something there. And you say, well, here's a list of 18 things I said I need to do. I think I did two of them, maybe three, maybe 15, who knows? If you really, but, but, a, but a real plan a real plan because these are the days. Let's take advantage of these days of opportunity. And Mr. Shem will pick up next week with the last class and uh, we'll pick up and continue on this fifth key, 
which is to use these days and channel them within us, the inspiration that we're feeling, the motivation, and the trepidation of the days of awe, to challenge that, to bring us closer to Hashem, so that we can find ourselves in a place where we are prepared for this world and the next. Thank you. Thank you.